Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to chapel. As we all know, this term, Mr. Lee is going to be preaching through a series on the five emotions that we find in Disney's movie, Inside Out. Today, we're going to be looking at the emotion of fear. I wonder, what is it that makes you scared? Well, follow us as we go through the school and ask lots of different people what it is that makes them fearful. I fear nothing. <laughs> Tyson is the only thing that I fear. All right, what makes me fearful? Spiders, but only the big huntsmen. I hate them. They're my, they're my biggest fear. I'm very scared of them. Something that I'm kind of scared of is uh, looking up in the sky and seeing magpies ready to swoop me. Something I fear is uh, that life will get too hard for me to be able to handle in the future. Uh, yeah, what makes me fearful is uh, facing the balling machine in the nets. Yeah, that's going like 100 clicks. It's insane. Um... I always get a bit freaked out around heights. Um, I've always been like that. But, um... What makes me scared is when I walk into class and the person sitting next to me was like, did you do the homework that was due last Monday? And then it's like that moment when you realise that you haven't done it and it's due today. Uh, something that brings me fear is actually uh, speaking in front of people, uh, especially when I have to speak in front of all the teachers more than all the, st all the students. What makes me fearful or uh, worried uh, is probably uh, some, anything happening to my kids, my own, I've got three children, that probably worries me more than anything else in the world. Uh, when I was playing sport, what brought me a lot of fear was injuries. Any injury was like the worst thing in the world. So they're probably the two things that I can think of that I'm fearful of. So what makes me fearful is playing basketball, in the last seconds of the game, getting the ball from my teammate, being trusted with the game-winning layup, wide open, no defense, and absolutely missing it. What makes me fearful is that uh, my children and the generations that come after them uh, will not love Jesus and will not have him as their king. So I'm a bit uh, worried about that. So I am very, very fearful of enclosed spaces because I have claustrophobia, but something that makes me more fearful than anything is uh, something bad happening to someone that I love. What brings me fear is blindness. Blindness to uh, things around you, people around you, blindness to God. You know, for people who don't see God in that way and don't see him at all. They're, they're, and that blindness is, is, is what brings me fear for people and, and fear for our world. All right, fearful. Uh, look, I don't like spiders, big hairy spiders, like I'm afraid of them. Um, but also when I look into the future and think about the world that my children might have to face and deal with, like I, th that makes me fearful. So what makes me fearful? What makes me fearful is self-righteousness born of willful ignorance. And I think that the poet W.B. Yeats captured this best when he said, in his poem, The Second Coming, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And I know from my own life and my knowledge of history and current world events that all it takes for evil to flourish is for good people to do nothing. Some of you might already know this, but apparently the Inuit people have more than 50 different words for snow. So they got a word for fresh snow, they have a word for fine snow, they have a word for soft and deep snow, they have a word for snowflakes, they have a word for snow banks, they have a word for snow storms. It might sound a little over the top, but it makes perfect sense when you think about it. They live in snow. Their whole lives are characterised by snow. If you're an Inuit, snow's kind of a big deal. In our culture, however, we have a whole bunch of different words for fear. So we talk about feeling not just afraid, but uneasy, worried, nervous, anxious, panicked, scared, frightened, terrified, petrified, just to name a few. And the long list of options shows just how much fear features in our lives. Fear is something everyone has to manage on some level, whether you're young or old, rich or poor, male or female. But unlike anger, which everyone has to manage as well, fear is much more socially acceptable. It's the most common emotion that drives people to counselling. And let's be real, it's much easier to admit to someone that you're struggling with fear than it is to tell them you've got a problem with anger. 
In Inside Out, fear has the shape and appearance of a raw nerve. It's entirely fitting given that his main job is to protect Riley and keep her safe. After all, it's our nerves that make us vulnerable to pain. Voiced by the comedian Bill Hader, fear is extremely risk averse. He's constantly on the lookout for potential dangers and when he's not operating the console, he's off making long lists of everything that could possibly go wrong in any given situation so that he and the other emotions are always prepared for anything. It's an exhausting job, as anyone who's ever had to put together a risk assessment plan will know, but it's an important job. After all, our fears usually revolve around our values. We fear when something we value comes under threat, when something bad could happen to someone we care about, when the future holds potential for loss. Fear motivates us to seek safety, control and certainty. But then fear's work is never really done because, let's be honest, the reality is that in this life, we'll never be completely safe, never fully in control or 100% certain of what will come next. Now, of course, fear is not necessarily a bad thing. Some level of fear is normal, healthy, useful even. But sometimes fear can be paralyzing. I once knew a boy who was so afraid of being judged that he never said anything in class unless he was absolutely forced to by the teacher. See, in this boy's mind, keeping quiet meant that there'd be less opportunities for his classmates to evaluate and therefore judge him based on anything that he said. The problem was, the less this boy spoke, the more weight and significance came to rest on each time that he did speak. And so as time went on, the pressure built up along with his anxiety. Uh, this boy became more sensitive, more alert to anything that smelt even remotely like it possibly could be maybe judgment. And as a result, he often read disapproval and condemnation into words and looks when they weren't actually there. And this, of course, only reinforced his original instinct to protect himself by saying nothing, thereby perpetuating the cycle and in fact making it worse. See, this is why fear is such a big issue in our lives. Because ultimately, we shape our lives around whatever it is that we fear. So if it's people that you fear, you'll likely spend all your time and energy managing your image. You know, making sure others only see the version of you that you think they'll like and approve of. Or if being poor is what you fear, you'll probably be pretty stingy with your money, anxious about how much you have or don't have, constantly keeping tabs on who owes who what. And if it's death that you fear, you'll be alarmed at even the smallest signs of sickness. You'll medicalize your entire life and you'll live just for the sake of staying alive. What is it that you fear? And how do you stop it from dominating your life, from determining your life? Well, it may come as a surprise to you, but the command that appears most frequently in the Bible is... Do not fear. It's not the command to love, though that's obviously at the heart of what God wants for human relationships. And it's not the command to care for the poor, even though that's clearly a priority as well. Now, the most repeated command in the Bible isn't about sex or alcohol or going to church or praying. It's do not fear. The senior minister at my church says it appears 366 times in total. That's one for every day of the year, uh, even on leap years. And we heard the command just a moment ago in Matthew's account of Jesus walking on water. According to Matthew, the disciples are out on a boat far from land when they're caught in this severe storm. And they're afraid. The wind's howling, the water's raging, the waves are rising up higher than the boat. And then all of a sudden, they see something that makes them even more afraid. They look out on the water and they see the figure of a man treading over the waves literally rising above the storm, marching towards the boat. Now, whatever fear they had of the storm pales in comparison because now they're seeing something or rather someone who is even greater than the storm. Matthew tells us that when the disciples see Jesus walking on water like this, they initially mistake him for a ghost. They're terrified and they cry out in fear. It's in this moment that Jesus responds to them with some of the most comforting and most significant words to ever fall from his lips. In verse 27, Jesus says, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. 
Now, what you've got to realize is that when Jesus says, it is I, or more literally, I am, he's not reassuring the disciples with a friendly, don't worry, guys, it's only me. He's actually making a statement, a claim about who he is that happens to be the biggest, most audacious claim anyone could possibly make. When Jesus says to the disciples, I am, he's using the exact same words God spoke to Moses at the burning bush when, God, when Moses asked God his name. God's reply was, I am. These are the exact same words that Jewish people like Jesus and the disciples would never dare to utter themselves because presuming to use God's name like this was considered an affront to his holiness. And yet here we have Jesus in the eye of the storm coming to his disciples using these exact words to identify himself, I am. In other words, Jesus is claiming to be none other than God himself. It's a claim that he would make more than once, and it's a claim that would eventually get him killed. But it's a claim that explains how he can say to the disciples in the midst of a raging storm threatening their lives, take courage and don't be afraid. Because the truth is, when God himself is with you, when the great I am, the Lord of the storm, the one who made both the wind and the waves, when you've got him in your corner, him on your side, well, then it's entirely appropriate to not be afraid. You know, when I first came to Trinity, uh, I was afraid. I thought this was a pretty scary place. I'd come from teaching English at a small school out west where things were fairly laid back and informal, uh, where I knew everyone and where everyone knew me. Uh, coming here was like coming to a whole other world. Uh, I was instantly overwhelmed by the amount of people, the amount of systems, the amount of details I needed to know just to get through a single day. I wasn't used to teaching all boys. I wasn't used to teaching Christian studies. And I felt like my classes were walking all over me. And when I looked around at the other teachers and how confident and capable and in control they seemed to be, I felt out of place, out of my depth. I felt intimidated. And I'd be lying if I said that I didn't think about quitting every other week. You know what? I would have quit too had I not known that there was someone greater than the storm. That's what kept me going. Knowing that there was someone far greater than even my most difficult year 10 class. That's what kept me going. Knowing there was someone far greater than even the most accomplished and intimidating staff member. That's what kept me going. Knowing that there was someone far greater than everything and everyone at Trinity combined. That's what kept me going. And it's what still keeps me going today. Not because I'm no longer scared. See, the fact is, there are still plenty of times that I get nervous, I feel intimidated and overwhelmed by this place. Having faith in Jesus doesn't mean that your fears are suddenly eliminated. But it does stop those fears from dominating and determining your life. Because when you have faith in Jesus, you know you've got the Lord of the storm walking alongside you. To come back to the story in Matthew's Gospel, I love that when Peter gets this, he jumps out of the boat and he finds that when he's focused on Jesus, he can walk on water too. It's only when he takes his eyes off Jesus, when the storm starts to dominate his vision, when his surroundings and his circumstances become all that he sees, that's when he begins to sink. See, our fears can have real power over us when we forget that there's someone greater than them. That's when our fears can grow. That's when our fears multiply and shape us in ways that aren't good for us. Now, I don't know what it is that you're afraid of. There's lots to be afraid of in this world. But I do know that Jesus is the great fear shrinker. He's the one whose power far exceeds anything that you and I could possibly be afraid of. And he proved it when he rose from the dead. And because he did that, because he beat death, because he's alive, the words that he spoke to the disciples in the storm are just as valid today as they were back then. Take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid.